All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Clemens, and I'm the Interim Library Director at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, Syracuse, New York. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for the final SUNY Open Access Week webinar. This webinar series is part of the SUNY Council of Library Directors' strategic plan to bring awareness and understanding of open access to the 64 SUNY campuses and beyond. In addition to our terrific speakers, this series was brought to you by the work of a talented and dedicated committee made up of members from various SUNY campuses, SUNY Press, and the Central New York Library Resources Council. You can see a list of our members on the SUNY Open Access website, and I'll repost that link just as soon as I'm done with my introduction. Uh, we hope that this webinar series will launch deeper discussions and involvement in open access for the members of our community. Our friends at CLRC will be monitoring the chat in case there are technical problems. So our, our friends at Temple, I hope that uh, tech support is going to be able to help you. Um, and I also want to say a, a special thank you to CLRC for hosting this Adobe Connect webinar and doing a tremendous amount of work through the registration process and all of those bits of work that goes in that go into a, a, a series like this. I'll be looking um, at the chat window for any questions. Fe please feel free to type questions as you think of them, but I want to make sure that Jill has enough time to share her presentation, so I will wait until that's concluded to begin the Q&A period. So feel free to type at any time, um, but let's hold our questions until the end. Finally, if you'll be taking part in social media, please use the webinar series hashtag SUNYOAWeek. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And you can also tweet to Jill. She's at Jilla Sella, and I'll also post that in the chat window again. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Jill. Jill Saracella is an Associate Librarian for Public Services and Scholarly Communication at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, or CUNY. In this position, she oversees reference, instruction, outreach, circulation, interlibrary loan, and thesis dissertation services, and leads the library's scholarly communication initiatives. And wow, that's a big job, so a special thank you for joining us today. Um, Jill is a vocal advocate of open access to scholarly literature and seeks to promote understanding and adoption of open access at CUNY and beyond. So welcome, Jill. Thank you so much. I just want to double check to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, great. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar series, which has really been wonderful, um, and for inviting me to talk today about authors' rights and other issues related to open access to scholarly journal articles. My presentation today is called, You Know What You Write, But Do You Know Your Rights? Understanding and Protecting Your Rights as an Author. And before I get started, I want to mention that my slides are available for download at bit.ly slash write hyphen rights. So, as we all know, there are many forms of scholarly output, journal articles, books, educational materials, data sets, and more. But my primary focus today is just one of these, scholarly journal articles. This is partially because of our time constraints and partially because the scholarly journal system in particular is in desperate need of scrutiny and overhaul. So what is the problem? <clears throat> Well, in short, the scholarly journal publishing system is a system in which university money, which includes tuition dollars and tax dollars combined with grant money, pay faculty to, to do research and record their research findings and articles, and then faculty give those articles, including the copyright to those articles, to publishers for free, and other researchers peer review those articles for free, and then university libraries pay dearly for subscriptions to the articles, so publishers get articles, copyrights and labor for free, and then on top of that, they rake in all of the subscription fees, and it is big money, mostly collected from nonprofit institutions. And because journals' price points are so high, library, libraries inevitably go without subscriptions to many of them, which means that students, faculty, and others still can't access the articles they need, including the articles authored by their school's own researchers. So you might wonder, wait, do authors really sign over their full copyright to journals for free? And the answer is yes. Many scholarly journals really do require authors to sign away their rights to their own articles. Here, for example, is the copyright transfer agreement that JAMA, or the Journal of the American Medical Association, requires their authors to agree to. Quote, 
In consideration of the action of the AMA in reviewing and editing the submission, I hereby transfer, assign, or otherwise convey all copyright ownership, including any and all rights incidental thereto, exclusively to the AMA in the event that such a work is published or such work is published by the AMA. So there you have it. Authors sign over all copyright and any and all rights incidental thereto. Personally, my favorite by uh, by which I, of course, mean my least favorite part of the phrase is, quote, in consideration of the action of the AMA and reviewing and editing the submission. Who cares if you did the research and you wrote the article? JAMA congratulates itself for reviewing and editing your article and demands full copyright in return. A lot of copyright transfer agreements look more like this, the one used by Wiley. As you can see, it's long, five pages and change. And as you can imagine, it's not entirely easy to understand. When an agreement is long and daunting like this, authors don't always read the whole thing, and when they do, they don't always fully understand what they're agreeing to. So both of these contracts use phrases like all copyright ownership, which means all of the rights included in copyright. And there are five exclusive rights that make up copyright. The right to pre reproduce the work, the right to prepare derivative works based on the work, the right to distribute copies of the work, the right to perform the work, and the right to display the work. Okay, so do you want to give away all your rights as an author? No, of course you don't. When you do that, you're left with no more rights to your article than anyone else has, which is simply what is allowed by fair use. Next question, do you have to give away all your rights as an author? Well, the answer used to be yes. Historically, when authors signed these agreements, they really had to sign away all rights to their article. Only the publisher could then distribute, copy, and republish the work. Often the agreement did not even allow for sharing copies of the articles with colleagues and students, but authors signed because they had to, because that's what people who wanted reappointment, tenure, promotion, and professional recognition did. But the world has slowly been shifting, and now when authors sign a copyright agreement, they're often left with more rights than they had in the past, and often more rights than they realize. So looking at those rights is what we're going to do in this webinar. So generally speaking, scholarly journals fall into one of two categories. The first is toll access journals. They are the traditional subscription-based journals, and as every Googler knows, many of these journals also sell individual articles at $20 or $30 or $40 a pop. So most toll access journals require authors to transfer full copyright to the journal, which then has exclusive rights to the journal. And then the second kind of journal is open access journals. These are journals that automatically and immediately make their articles available online to all at no cost. And as many of you no doubt know, another term for these journals is gold open access. So most gold open access journals do not take copyright. They generally use Creative Commons licenses instead. And I'll talk more about Creative Commons licenses a bit later. So those are the two main types of journals, but there's another flavor of journal, and that's journals that let authors share. These are journals toll access or open access that allow authors to post or self-archive their articles in open access repositories. This method of making materials freely available to the public is known as green open access, and it's my main focus today. So a minute ago, I said that most toll access journals take copyright, and they do. But green toll access journals also give back some rights to the author, namely the right to self-archive. Oops, I didn't actually mean to go ahead yet. Um, the right to self-archive is not the only right that matters, but it's a very important right for researchers because what they most want is for their research articles to be found, read, and cited. They write to contribute to the scholarly conversation, and an article is a much greater contribution to the conversation if it's easy to find and free to read. And of course, journals don't pay authors, so authors don't lose out in any way by sharing their articles. For the author, there is only upside. So, how can you find out whether a journal allows self-archiving? Well, you can of course track down its copyright transfer agreement and try to make sense of it. Here again is Wiley's agreement, my go-to illustration of scary contracts. And if you're um, still thinking of what your Halloween costume might be, it could be this. Um, but, much easier than reading all the legalese is using the online tool Sherpa Romeo, which summarizes journals' policies about copyright and self-archiving in a very easy to understand way. 
Here is the Sherpa Romeo page for the Journal of Symbolic Logic, a journal that takes copyright but also gives back a lot of rights. That first green check mark tells us that they give authors the right to self-archive their original pre-refereed manuscript, which is also known as a preprint. The second green check mark um, indicates that authors are also allowed to self-archive the revised post-refereed version, which is also known as a post-print. And the third check mark indicates that authors can even self-archive the publisher's final formatted PDF. There are some particulars listed in the bullets just below those check marks, and you should always, always read those as well to see what the additional conditions are. Um, but the overall picture of this journal is that they're very good with respect to self-archiving. This next one is also quite good, though not as good. Um, it allows self-archiving of both the preprint and the postprint, but it does not allow self-archiving of the final formatted PDF. This next one is not great. They allow self-archiving of the pre-refereed version or preprint, um, but the post-refereed versions, neither of them are allowed to be posted on freely accessible websites. And this journal is my favorite example of a very, very bad journal, very author unfriendly. It allows no self-archiving whatsoever. And furthermore, if you look at those bullets below the three red X's, you see a note that says that the only thing that can be freely posted online is not the abstract, but a summary of the abstract. So they are incredibly author unfriendly. So we've seen the range. Some publishers allow this and some publishers allow that, but what's the big picture? How prevalent is permission to self-archive? So as of last night, Sherpa Romeo covers uh, 2,287 publishers and 80% allow some form of self-archiving, half of which allow archiving of both the preprint and the postprint. This means that a huge number of preprints and postprints could be made freely available online if only researchers, one, knew about their rights, two, had a place to put their articles, and three, actually exercised their rights to put them there. And again, why wouldn't authors want to make their articles freely available to everyone? After all, it's not like any of that money that the publishers make is shared with authors. One important thing to be aware of, though, is that some publishers demand a sort of head start in order to maximize their subscription and sales dollars out of the gate. So what they do is impose embargoes or periods of time during which authors cannot share their works online. These embargoes are usually between 6 and 24 months. Okay, so suppose you do have the right to self-archive and you want to do so. Where can you self-archive? Where should you self-archive? So a great place to self-archive is an institutional repository. An institutional repository, also known as an IR, is an online database offered by an institution to collect, preserve, and share scholarly journal articles and other works created by that institution's community. But of course, self-archiving in an IR is only possible at institutions with a repository. Happily, here at CUNY, we have CUNY Academic Works, and for those of you at SUNY, some of you participate in the SUNY Digital Repository, a DSpace repository, and some of you are part of the Digital Commons of SUNY. And for those of you listening from elsewhere, some of your schools will have repositories, um, but not all. It's an increasingly common library service, but it is not universal yet. So suppose you don't have one, where else can you self-archive? Another place is a subject repository, a repository dedicated to one or more fields of study. Some of the biggest subject repositories may be familiar to you. Archive.org for physics, math, computer science, PubMed Central for the health sciences, REPEC for economics, um, and then there's some newer ones like BioArchive for biology, and for librarians there is ELIS, which is for library and information science. And you can find more disciplinary repositories in the directory of open access repositories, but be aware that not all fields have a subject repository. So <clears throat> another really huge disciplinary repository is SSRN, or the Social Science Research Network. However, earlier this year it was purchased by our um, frenemy Elsevier, which has made a lot of people concerned about the direction that it might go in moving forward and how Elsevier will monetize the documents posted there. 
Um, and indeed, there have been some troubling reports about articles getting taken down um, by Elsevier without notice since the purchase. Um, and the Authors Alliance reached out to Elsevier asking them to commit to a set of principles for SSRN moving forward, and Elsevier refused. So not surprisingly, a lot of people who are familiar with Elsevier's track record feel that we should be very wary of Elsevier's intentions for SSRN. However, coincidentally, um, a new open access repository for the social sciences arrived this summer. It's called Soch Archive, um, and it's being developed by the Center for Open Science and a board of librarians and scholars deeply committed to open access. It's still really, really new and quite small, but I do fully expect it to be um, a major player in the world of repositories. Okay. And then there are commercial sites like ResearchGate and Academia.edu. They do allow users to upload art articles, and many users do, even though many publishers forbid posting on for-profit sites. And be very, very clear that these are for-profit sites, despite the confusing and undeserved .edu in Academia.edu. They are using documents you give them for free to make a profit, apparently by selling data about users' behavior on the site. And if they don't make a profit, eventually they'll either shut down or be sold, and then all bets are off about what will happen to your works posted there. And then, of course, there are personal websites. Posting to a personal website is a good step in the direction of green open access, but personal websites are not permanent. They generally disappear shortly after you resign or retire from a university if you have a university website or web page, um, after you die, um, or if you just fail to pay the do domain name bill. And also, they're generally not indexed by Google Scholar or library discovery tools, so they're not the best option for making your work publicly findable and accessible. So when you consider the, impermanent, sorry, the impermanence of personal websites and the conflicts inherent in commercial sharing sites, it becomes clear that institutional and disciplinary repositories are the best places to self-archive. So of course, there's more to a copyright agreement than self-archiving policies. And in order to really understand a journal's policies, and especially if you are on the verge of signing an agreement, you really, really should read the agreement itself. When you read the contract, keep your eye out for a few things. First, does it ask for a full copyright transfer, or does it leave copyright with you and simply request a license to your work? Oops, I just realized I made a mistake on that slide. I, uh, I wrote if contract, but I meant to write if it's a copyright transfer, does it give any rights back to you? If so, which ones? If it doesn't, be very cognizant of the fact that after signing, you will have no more rights to your work than anyone else. You'll only be allowed to do what's permitted by fair use. And in cases like this, you should definitely try to negotiate with a publisher to try to retain some rights for yourself. But if it leaves copyright with you and requests a license, try to um, keep an eye out for whether it's an exclusive or non-exclusive license. If it's exclusive, only the publisher will have the right to do those things. But if it's non-exclusive, you can exercise those rights yourself and also give the rights to others. Also, if it's a license, is it a license for all five of those rights included in copyright or just some of them? Keep in mind that if they want an exclusive license for all five rights, then be aware that what they're demanding is essentially the same as a copyright transfer in every way except name. Finally, does it call your work a work for hire or work made for hire? If it does, that's a big red flag. What they're saying is that legally speaking, they're not just the copyright owner, but the author of the work, which is certainly not an author-friendly stance. And <clears throat> Unless you agreed to those terms before creation, it's actually legally questionable whether it can be considered a work for hire, so it's legally murky as well. So in short, if you see that language, start asking questions. OK, so let's take um, some closer looks at some contracts. Here is that JAMA contract we, show, we saw earlier. And as I pointed out before, it says that you transfer, assign, or otherwise convey all copyright ownership, including any and all rights incidental thereto, exclusively to the AMA. It's short, it's easy to understand, and it's absolute. You give them all rights, end of story. However, it's actually not the end of the story. That's all there is in the contract, but there's actually a lot more information on their instructions for authors page. 
First, they state that they themselves actually make all JAMA articles freely available six months after publication. And then they lay out some permissions regarding posting to nonprofit repositories uh, if the authors wish to do that. So I find it very interesting that that language isn't in the contract and is instead uh, just on their policies page on their website. I would need to talk to a lawyer to be sure, and I only just discovered this recently, um, so I haven't had a chance to do that. But I think it means that by not putting this language in the contract, it's not guaranteed that it's their policy right now, but they can change it in the future, which they couldn't do if it were in the signed contract. Okay. So back to Wiley, that behemoth we looked at earlier. Um, it's really big and hard to look at it, but when we do look at it carefully, we see something interesting. It's still a full copyright transfer, but it also enumerates permitted uses by the author. In other words, it gives some rights back to you. And it divides them into three categories, the same three categories we saw in Sherpa Romeo. For the submitted manuscript, it gives the authors the right to self-archive immediately. For the accepted manuscript, or the postprint, it gives authors uh, the right to self-archive after an embargo period has passed. And for the final published version, it gives authors just a few rights. Not the right to self-archive at all, but the right to make copies for colleagues, reuse in other publications, use in teaching, and give oral presentations based on the final publication. It's actually really quite insane to me that those aren't absolute inalienable rights, but they're not, and you only have them because they say you do. So I'm going to take a little two-slide two detour here for a moment. Um, a growing number of institutions, as I'm sure you know, have policies to ensure that their researchers' articles become freely available. And similarly, many grant funding agencies require that the research they fund to become freely available to all. In response to those um, policies, some publishers have tried something kind of new. They've made different rules for voluntary self-archiving and policy-mandated self-archiving. These rules essentially say, nonsensically, in my opinion, you may self-archive if you wish, but not if you must. So, for example, let's look at Emerald. Their policy includes both of the following statements. First, Emerald supports an author's right to voluntarily self-archive their works without payment or embargo. And then second, if you are mandated to make your work open access but have no funds for an article processing charge, you may deposit the author-accepted manuscript of your article into a subject or institutional repository and your funder's research catalog subject to embargo periods. And depending on the journal, Emerald's embargoes, embargo periods are either 12 or 24 months. Um, so though that's an interesting um, sequence of statements. Um, but what about the people who wish to make their works open access, but who also happen to work at institutions with an open access policy? So I and a whole lot of other people agree um, that it is still voluntary self-archiving in that case, um, that the policy just doesn't make sense. Okay, back to agreements. The open access publisher Biomed Central has a much shorter agreement, and very importantly, it is not a copyright transfer, but a license agreement. The, le the legalese can still be a little overwhelming, but the key language is this. Um, that the authors agree to license the article under a Creative Commons attribution license, and then interestingly, agree to make any associated data available under a Creative Commons public domain waiver. I'll talk more about the flavors of Creative Commons uh, licenses in just a few slides. Okay, so finally, Here's the publication agreement from College and Research Libraries, which is also an open access journal. This one is a little bit more complex, but it's also the most flexible and therefore the most author friendly. What it says is that authors grant the publisher a non-exclusive license to print, publish, reproduce, and distribute the work, leaving copyright with the author. However, it does make the author agree not to publish the article in print before the publication of the journal issue, and also um, makes the author agree to cite the journal version when publishing elsewhere. But it's this last part that's really interesting to me and fairly uncommon. So by default, it publishes the article with a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license, but it allows authors to choose a different license or choose not to add a license at all, in which case full copyright applies and others can only do what's allowed by fair use and thus they seek permission from the author. So, 
What if you want to publish in a journal that you find too restrictive or unfriendly? So if you don't like the terms of their policy, you can negotiate with them and you don't have to start from scratch. Instead, you can use the Spark author addendum, which lays out rights that you likely want to re retain. You simply fill out the addendum and attach it to the journal's copyright transfer agreement. Or another tool is the, Scholar, the Scholar's Copyright Addendum Engine, where you can choose from a few different options. Um, or you can try the addendum from the Committee on Institutional Cooperation. Not all publishers accept these addenda, but some do. And if you want to negotiate, it's often better to use an established tool that journals have seen before and already understand. You never know. It doesn't always work, but it's worth a shot. Now, what about articles you've already published? Can you ask after the fact? Yes, you can. And it also sometimes works. You can write to publishers after publication and request the right to self-archive or other rights. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no, and sometimes they just ignore you. Um, at the Graduate Center, we've had some success making these requests. We've gotten, we've gotten several uh, yeses and we've gotten several non-responses. So, as I mentioned earlier, and as you saw when we were looking at the Biomed Central and College and Research Libraries agreements, most open access journals use Creative Commons licenses, which grant the public permission to use the work in more ways than traditional copyright allows. So a very important point about Creative Commons licenses, though, is that it also gives you, the author, more rights than you'd have after signing a traditional copyright transfer agreement. Some people worry that Creative Commons licenses mean that they're giving up control of their work, but actually they allow you to have much more control than you'd have with a traditional copyright transfer. So the absolute most permissive Creative Commons license is the Public Domain Dedication Waiver, also known as CC0, which means that you waive all rights to your work and effectively put it in the public domain. Um, and between the extremes of traditional copyright and CC0, there are numerous possibilities. The differences can seem kind of overwhelming, but it's actually not that confusing because it all boils down to three simple distinctions. The first one, and this is a pretty easy one, is do you want to waive all interests in the work? If so, use, a, use the CC0 waiver, which allows anyone to use the work any way they want, no attribution required. Um, I was saying this is an easy question because almost nobody wants to give up the right to attribution to their scholarly writings. Data sets are a different story, but for their scholarly writings, basically everybody wants to preserve the right to, uh, to attribution. So um, in the world of scholarly literature, you usually see the other licenses. And to understand those, you really have to answer just two other simple questions. First, will others be allowed to use the work for commercial purposes? If yes, you have the licenses in the left column. Attribution, attribution to share alike, and attribution no derivatives. If not, you have the licenses in the right column. They all have a little NC label on them for non-commercial. The next distinction is, will others be allowed to modify the work and make derivative works? If yes, then you have the top row, either attribution only, meaning people can do anything they want provided they attribute you, or attribution non-commercial, meaning people can do anything they want provided they attribute you and they don't use it commercially. If no, you don't want them to be able to make derivative works, then you go with the bottom row, um, and those have little ND marks on them for no derivative works. And then this is a subtlety. If you do want people to be able to make derivative works, but you want those people to then make their derivative works available under the same conditions that you made your original work, then you go for the options in the middle row, which include a little SA on them for share alike. And that's sometimes called copy left, meaning you're putting your work into the commons and you want all derivative works to do the same. It's a way of trying to grow the commons. So there's a fair amount of debate about which Creative Commons license is best. One major player, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, explicitly favors the CC BY license, where attribution and nothing else is required. They feel that in order to really realize the potential of open access, barriers to Sorry, barriers to reuse must be minimized, um, and they feel that the restrictions that the other CC licenses um, have needlessly limit and inhibit reuse. So um, in their argument, one of the things they say is that they compare CC BY to a universal blood type, pointing out it's the license with maximal compatibility with other licenses. So personally, 
I prefer CC licenses, uh, some CC licenses to others, and I certainly see the benefits of CC BY, but I also understand the arguments against it. Um, so what I will say is that I embrace all of the Creative Commons licenses as huge improvements over traditional copyright, at least in the realm of scholarly journal articles. So, as we've seen, most publishers limit the copyright and licensing options you have for your work, but it's still important to understand that full range of Creative Commons licenses regardless of what the publishers are saying because you create more than just books and journal articles. So most of us also create one or more of the things on this list posters, slideshows, conference papers, open educational resources, reports and working papers, blog posts, and you, the creator, can choose how to license most of that work since most of it isn't going through a publisher. Okay, so that's pretty much everything I have to say about publishing agreements and self-archiving, but now I want to do a little encore or a little coda to talk a little bit more about gold open access journals that, um, as I said before, automatically and immediately make articles freely available online to all. Specifically, I'd like to um, engage in a little myth-busting. So people sometimes confuse what exactly the open means in open access journals. So always remember these two little equations. Um, open access means anyone can read the journal. It does not mean that anyone can publish in the journal. Open access journals are real journals. Publishing in one is not self-publishing or vanity publishing. And of course, open access journals earn respectability in the same way that other journals do through the quality of their articles and the prominence of the people they attract as authors, editorial board members, and peer reviewers. Of course, just as there are some non-open access or toll access journals that are better and more rigorously peer reviewed than others, of course there are some open access journals that are uh, better and more rigorously peer reviewed than others. Um, before submitting to any journal, toll access or open access, research its quality. So um, producing um, an open access journal isn't free. It's not as expensive as producing a subscription-based journal in which you have to endeavor and spend money to keep people out of the journal. Um, it does take some time and, well, it takes a lot of time and it does take some money. So, of course, the fundamental fact about open access journals, though, is that they're free to read. So how do they cover their costs? What are the economics? Um, as you can see, there's a bunch of different ways ranging from volunteers to advertising to selling print editions to grant funding and endowments to charging article publication charges in which authors pay a processing fee that covers the journal's costs. So your first reaction might be, publication charges, that's insane. Um, yes, it is true. Some open access journals have article processing charges or APCs, but many do not. But remember that it's also the case that some subscription-based journals charge publication fees to the authors. They sometimes charge for imagery production, for color printing, sometimes for, uh, for some other things as well. So people um, sometimes get upset about the existence of these fees, so this is very important. APCs are not necessarily paid from researchers' pockets. Some institutions pay APCs for their, uh, for their employees and researchers. Uh, grant funds can also be used to pay APCs, and some journals waive the APCs for those who do not have funding for them. So some people still find those publication charges worrisome. They wonder, well, if there are publication fees, isn't that vanity publishing? And the answer is still no. At reputable journals, the fact that accepted articles have publication fees has no bearing whatsoever on whether an article is accepted. But you might ask, what about the disreputable journals? So it does pain me, but wherever there's a chance for a profit, there will be people who profiteer. And there is the phenomenon, as I'm sure many of you know, of predatory open access publishers. They are open access publishers whose mission is profit, not the dissemination of scholarly information. It's not that they publish scholarship and happen to have charges to cover their expenses. No, it's the other way around. It's that they charge fees to make a profit and then happen to publish some articles, many of questionable quality since they don't have any kind of rigorous or true peer review system. 
unfortunately, by having shady practices, these journals put the reputation of open access more generally at risk, but they shouldn't. Um, you might have heard of certain lists of predatory publishers, but any list is going to be problematic, and the most famous list, Beale's list, is certainly problematic for reasons I'm not going to go into right now. Um, so I urge you to forget about the lists and instead learn how to think critically about journal quality. And I highly recommend the site Think, Check, Submit for helping you evaluate journals. And don't just evaluate open access journals, evaluate all journals. Um, low quality journals really aren't unique to open access publishing. There are plenty of low quality subscription based journals out there, including by the big publishers we all know. Often we subscribe to them in libraries, not because we choose to subscribe to them, but because they're in the di big deal packages of journals. Um, so there are unfortunately the dis disreputable journals. But um, how do you find the good open access journals? Um, to do that, you can take a look at the DOAJ, or the Directory of Open Access Journals. It's exactly what it sounds like, a browsable, searchable database of information about open access journals that have been vetted to try to make sure they meet certain ethical and quality standards. And there are a lot of such gold open access journals, over 9,000 across all fields. And even though there's a lot of attention paid to um, article processing charges when people talk about gold open access journals, be aware that the majority of the journals in DOAJ do not charge APCs at all. So. Speaking of predation, remember that graphic from the beginning? And then remember that really daunting contract? Well, keep those in mind. And then consider this chart. Yeah. Like which, um, yeah, have a good weekend. Oh. sorry, I heard talking. Um, so keep, uh, keep those images in mind. And then consider this chart, which shows the explosion of library serial expenditures from 1986 to 2011. You probably can't see the numbers because they're so small, but spending on serials increased by 402% in that time period. And then add to that this chart of profit margins, which shows that the big scholarly publishers have higher profit margins than Google and Apple and a whole bunch of other companies too, ones that aren't shown here like Disney and Starbucks. So when you factor all of that in, you have to ask yourself, who are the real predators? The profiteers who publish low quality open access journals so bad that most people can, with a little education about evaluation, learn to avoid them, or the profiteers who demand authors copyrights for free and then sell the articles at exorbitant prices. In my opinion, it's really the big scholarly publishers that do much more damage to the research ecosystem. So the takeaway is don't let the so-called predatory publishers scare you off. Open access is a viable and sustainable publishing model. Some open access journals, of course, are better than others, but the model is sound. On the other hand, traditional, highly profitable scholarly journal publishing is restrictive, expensive, outmoded, sometimes exploitative, and arguably unnecessary. Open access journals should be, and generally are, reader friendly and author friendly. It is publication in the truest sense. It makes work public. And it benefits just about every group of people you can imagine, except for some publishers. So my advice to authors is research any journal or publisher that you're considering, investigate their quality, their peer reviewing process, their copyright policy, and their self-archiving policy. If you have the right to self-archive your article, exercise that right. If you don't have the right to self-archive, request it. You should always choose the best publishing venue for you and your career, but I encourage you also to think about the system you're contributing to and the system you want to contribute to and always seek to know your rights to what you write. There are my credits. And um, I just want to remind you both that you can find the slides at bit.ly slash write hyphen rights, um, and that I've given them a Creative Commons attribution license, so you're welcome to use and reuse these slides however you like at your campuses. Um, um, so let's chat. Who has questions? All right, Jill, you cut out just a tiny bit at the end there, um, but I want to say thank oh, I'm you sorry. for sharing. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that um, you you weren't still talking, um, but I want to say thanks.
for sharing your slides. I'm someone who has used uh, an older presentation to talk, to talk about, um, you know, open access and author's rights and things like that, you know, finding you on SlideShare and things like uh, such as that. So it's very helpful. Um, there are a few people who are who have questions about the process of using the Spark Addendum. Um, so could you maybe describe the process that you've been through? You know, when do you add it? How do you, like, is it something that you strike through and write on? Could you tell us a little bit about the process of using a Spark or other author addendum? So most of the time the addendum lays out, already lays out what you want. So all you need to do is fill in the information about your article and then sign it. Um, granted, the notion of an addendum is goes along with a sort of outdated notion about the contract that you physically sign and scan or mail back in. Um, sometimes with journals now, you're just digitally accepting their terms um, in their in their publishing system and not signing. Um, and then you need to send the addendum in, um, you know, separately from from the contract or in, just initiate a conversation and ask them if they will accept it. Um, because it is definitely the case that it's not always like a paper-based contract that you sign anymore that you can just staple an addendum to. So Polly um, in the chat says that she also keeps email correspondence recording addenda terms and agreements. Is that something that's fairly common or how do you keep track of that paper trail when there really isn't necessarily paper always involved? Is there a best practice there? That's a really good question. And at CUNY, um, I'm not sure that I have a great answer yet because our institutional repository is pretty new. And so we're still figuring out best practices. But certainly, um, when we have corresponded with publishers on behalf of authors, which we sometimes do, we certainly keep a file of those uh, emails. Um, and when authors self-submit to the repository, they have to um, um, click on an agreement indicating that they have the right. So we take authors' words for it, uh, that they do have the right when they're self-submitting. Um, if a publisher were to get in touch with us saying that it was posted illegally, we would then demand that the publisher show us the evidence that they have the exclusive right to do that. But we have not had that experience yet. And my understanding is that even the, the long-standing repositories have very, very few experiences with that. In general, the publishers have gone after sites like academia.edu with takedown notices rather than institutional repositories. It's pretty rare. So you mentioned a little bit about uh, APCs or article processing charges and yesterday we were learning about a group who at UB who started a journal using the platform Scholastica and I was really surprised um, to find out that it that Scholastica only charges ten dollars per article um, to use that platform and all of the, the software behind it and then I think about PLOS which has an APC of about three thousand dollars so mm -hmm. do you, and you, I'm, I'm sure you know lots of different numbers and figures, but could you maybe, you know, describe what APCs do um, for the authors or the publishers? That's a great question. Um, so with PLOS, my understanding of how PLOS set their price point is that um, that was the price point for most subscription-based journals in the sciences, because as I mentioned, a lot of subscription-based journals have fees as well for illustrations or color or um, excess pages. And so they they did an environmental scan, saw that that was an, a very uh, common price, um, about that $3,000 mark, and realized, OK, the market can bear that. Um, that's what the other publishers are doing, so, that, so we can do that too and make it open access. Um, um, PLOS is a nonprofit, but they do they do bring in a lot of revenue with which they do a lot of uh, a lot of things. They have exceptionally well designed articles. They um, they do a lot of open ac access outreach. Um, but 
it has become quite clear that it is not necessary to charge those those level of APCs to keep a journal running. Um, they they're they're kind of uh, in a special case because they're in the sciences where almost all of this uh, research is grant funded anyway, um, and so the scientists don't don't bristle as much when it's coming out of grant funding. And again, because they're paying fees like that anyway. Um, but yes, it is definitely the case that it costs some money. You know, server space isn't free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's um, but high quality journals can definitely be produced for a lot less money than that. And it's also worth mentioning that some journals, it's not that common, but some journals have what's called like a reading fee or um, a submission fee where you pay upon submission. So everybody who submits has to pay. And then there are no fees beyond that. Um, and the journals that I know of that do that um, are ones where the acceptance rate is so low that just charging fees of the accepted articles wouldn't be sustainable. So I think that's an interesting model, though I can imagine it wouldn't be popular with a lot of researchers. I really liked that you used the phrase, uh, you know, what the market will bear when referring to APCs, because that's something that I hear uh, quite a bit in the traditional um, publishing or, you know, when working with our vendors. Why is something so expensive? Well, that's what the market will bear. So I think that, right. you know, from, from, you know, my role as an interim library director, it's, it's interesting to, to know that and to have a little bit of flexibility. And that's also where, you know, as we do more and more with open access, there are different types of models out there. We can be a little bit more competitive and maybe we can't bear the current market price in a sustainable way. And that's already pretty obvious. Um, and also uh, an interesting subtlety is uh, with uh, PLOS and a bunch of other publishers, they have um, waivers, as I mentioned, for people who don't have funding to pay the fee. Um, and some universities that have funds for paying APCs also have a policy that they will only pay the APC for journals that have a policy willing to waive the APC for others. So it's a very interesting way in which the, the better funded universities can encourage good practices among, among open access journals, saying, yes, we'll happily pay you, but only if you will happily waive the fee for those who can't. That's really interesting. I, I haven't heard that before. What a great model when you think about the scholarly society or the scholarly communication um, piece as a as a whole, not necessarily one institution. Yes, and it's um it's called oh I'm gonna forget um uh, the copy I think uh the oh no oh cope copy. that's it the coalition of for open access publishing equity I think that's it and there are a bunch of schools in it. Um, SUNY Maritime has asked a question, does CUNY have any funds to help with APCs? No. Um, at individual campuses, um, individual provosts will, will agree to pay fees sometimes, but we don't have a, any kind of centralized fund or a fund at any of the campuses, specific campuses as far as I know, and it's because we're in an austerity climate. Um, it's, it's, it would be wonderful if we could, but it's a hard case to make when we're already in a position of cutting resources from year to year. Let's see here. Oh, sorry, I just scrolled a little too fast. So what have, what have been some of the challenges as you've been working with faculty to bring more awareness about APCs and different funding, funding models? What have been some of the challenges that you've helped faculty work through? So definitely I, I often point out that right, they can use their, their grant funding for it, but often a common response is, 
but it wasn't written into my grant. I didn't budget for it ahead of time. And so then it's that they're informed next time that they can budget it, budget it into their grant. Um, but in all honesty, what I tend to do is I feel like APCs is a difficult topic. Um, if there is not easy, easy access to funding, people certainly don't want to be paying out of their pockets. Um, and so I often change the conversation back to green open access and, and tell them that um, wherever they publish, make sure they retain the right to self-archive and then exercise that right. And then they will be sharing that work um, and not having to pay APCs, but it is definitely, definitely tricky at schools uh, like the CUNY schools and I'm sure the SUNY schools where we're just not very flush. Seems like a positive spin on something that could be a little bit negative. So if they, you know, didn't think two years ago to write it in the grant and now they've got their final product, I could see how that would be somewhat frustrating for faculty, but to, you know, think about different options and then plan more um, carefully in the future, that seems like a, a pretty good, um, you know, in interaction. So it's a really good way to go about doing things like that. Yeah, I feel like um, there are lots of strong feelings about gold open access journals, some deserved, some undeserved, but green open access is something that like all reasonable people can agree is a good thing. How do you see, so this is a question from Alfred University, Alfred State, and New York State College of Ceramics. How do you see organizations, um, we can use PLOS as an example, changing in the future in terms of article processing charges when federal funding requirements um, necessitate that output being available a year or so after publication, no matter what? So if the trend is going to be moving towards, you know, requiring green, does that impact APCs moving forward, in your opinion? That's a good question. Um, I, I can imagine APCs going down as a result, but I also want to point out that PLOS has a lot going for it beyond its open accessness. Um, and one is that it publishes on a rolling basis. So unlike the subscription paste journals, which are usually divided into issues, uh, discrete issues, and then there, as a result, there's generally length um, guidelines or requirements per issue. Things can get backlogged for a re really long time, like it might get accepted and then it only comes out 18 months later. But PLOS um, publishes articles as they become ready. So it's a, it's a faster route to publication, both because of that and because they endeavor to have timely peer review. So that's one other big point um, for PLOS. And then also a lot of the PLOS journals are very highly respected journals, whether you want to look at impact factor or not. Impact factor is a very fraught metric, but um, but um, they a lot of them do have very high impact factors. And if you don't even think about impact factor, they are they are journals that uh, command a lot of respect. Um, so I think PLOS will continue to be a very popular venue, even when um, when other articles really pretty universally start becoming open access a year after publication. And then also in the realm of the sciences where where um, research builds on other research, there's, um, there's really value in having it out immediately rather than with a 12 month lag. Okay, and our last question, um, how have you built relationships with faculty to advertise the IR and how that relates um, to authors' rights issues? Um, it's a great question, and I feel like awareness and acceptance is by no means universal yet. Um, and, and so I talk about it a lot, a lot, and I'm sort of sick of hearing myself talk about it, and only some subset of the faculty um, um, 
become interested. Um, but I, I have had faculty realize that um, you know, even even if their first interest isn't so much the institutional repository, I've had some faculty ask me to help them understand what they're what they're agreeing to and what their rights are, um, and so that's valuable to them. Um, having me help them understand their contracts, um, and and then those that I do convince to get into the institutional repository really really like getting notifications of their download counts and are 201 of the people I've spoken to convinced that it's being more broad uh, uh, more broadly read both in terms of number and and in terms of geographical spread than it would have been otherwise and they really really like that there's one faculty member who you know multiple times a year will forward me his email with the download counts and he's just so thrilled with the numbers he's seeing and he's convinced that his research would not be um, hitting as many eyes otherwise. And then as a result, he talks to his colleagues about it. Um, so I feel like there are the people who are willing and interested in listening to librarians about it and then there are the people who really only want to hear it from their colleagues, um, but the people who um, who really engage with me in the conversation can then be the people who spread the word to their colleagues. But again, it's early days still here. Um, we're, we're still working hard to get the message out. Um, and, and sometimes it can be frustrating. I feel like I've been talking about repositories for years and I still only gotten the attention of a small fraction of the faculty. I like that you brought up um, impact in a really nice way. I know our our IR also has that uh, geographic input from, you know, the, the system. So what's the reach geographically of our, you know, all of our collections? And then you can also dial it down to the individual level. So I think, you know, especially for our researchers who are collaborating with people in other countries, it's really impactful for them to see not only just the numbers, but just the, the spread or the reach of their work. Um, so I think that that's, that's also meaningful. And um, my colleague, Megan Wacha, who spoke on Monday, she arranged to, on the cover page of every item in the repository, have a link that says something like, you know, how does access to this work help you? Let us know. And it's a link to a little survey where, obviously, a very, very, very small fraction of people take the time to click that link. But the people who have and have filled out the form to let us know um, why they're interested in it and how it's helping them is is amazing. People are so grateful. Um, and, and, and often, they're not people that you think of as um, traditional researchers. A lot of publishers like to say, oh, everybody who has access needs, um, everybody who needs access has it already because they're at a research institution. Nobody else really needs it. They wouldn't be able to understand it anyway. And what we find out from people who fill out this form is that is not true. They are people who are perfectly well equipped to benefit from the research and not affiliated with a research institution. Yeah, Megan presented that piece at the SUNY Librarians Association conference last June, and uh -huh. holy cow, what a great idea. So. Yes, and a bunch of repositories have, like if Harvard, the Harvard Dash repository, they have, um, they've posted online a bunch of the responses they've gotten, and I believe um, eScholarship from the University of California, they also have posted a bunch of the responses they've gotten. Um, yeah. And so that really helps to both to, delight and give, you know, positive reinforcement to those who are um, depositing and encouragement to those who are thinking of depositing, um, but it also really helps, like, destroy the canard from publishers that everyone who needs access already has access. So I've just got about one minute of wrap-up, um, but University of New Orleans Library said, could you give us the name of the IR that has the cover page with the survey? And so that's going to be CUNY Academic Works. Yes, um, that's so, right. I don't know. Would you, so does every article or does every item have that survey or is it just a special collection? It is such a good question. Um, I believe. Eve, everything that is in the publications and research section of the repository, like there are some archival materials as well, and I don't, I, Megan can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they have that link on it, but everything in the publications and research um, section does have that link. Um, and um, I'm going to type into 
the chat box right now the URL for CUNY Academic Works. It's just academicworks.cuny.edu. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing this presentation. And I really want to thank all of our attendees. Um, after this is over, um, there will be a survey that immediately pops up. So please, if you would, just take two minutes to review the series, provide us with a little bit of feedback, which will help us focus future open access uh, efforts. Um, your input is really highly valued, and we appreciate you spending time with us today. And for those of you who have attended more than one session, thank you so much. If you know someone who would like to see this webinar but couldn't make it today, all of the webinars will be posted on the SUNY Open Access website. Um, and three of them are already up. This and one other one, um, the one from yesterday, it might take just a few days to, to have that um, available on the website. So please be patient. Um, and please share all of these amazing presentations, all of this, all of these great ideas. And thank you again to Jill. And good luck, everyone, with your open access efforts. Have a great weekend. And do you mind if I just add one more thing? Oh, please. So um, as I mentioned, my slides are online, and they have a Creative Commons attribution only license. But if if anyone is thinking about you know, repurposing this, um, reworking it for their own audiences at their own schools. I'm very nerdy and I take incredibly detailed notes when I'm preparing for a presentation. And so if you'd like me to share uh, my notes so you can um, allow that to help you flesh out your script, I'd also be happy to share those. So anybody can get in touch with me for that. Such a kind offer. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone.